You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget, how you can become a gratitude believer, and maybe one or two or three takeaways from today's show and today's guest. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, or any other places where you get your podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Thank you so much for that. And also, people ask me about the gratitude journals quite a bit. So to purchase a gratitude journal or find out more about my gratitude speaking, coaching, group coaching, or one-on-one coaching, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com as well as thatgratitudeguypodcast.com either place. So let me get on to the show and get to the most important thing of all. That's my guest today. Let me tell you a little bit, about, little bit about my guest, Leanne Marie Webster, is the creator of Email with Heart, H-E-A-R-T, and Lead Machine Weekend, which I went through myself. It was quite impressive. She helps entrepreneurs build, grow, and nurture their email lists without being cheesy or sleazy, or I'll add a third thing, salesy. She is, the, she is an inspirational speaker, lawyer, coach, and entrepreneur with over 20 years experience in marketing and business development in a range of development rather in a range of industries. Leanne is a digital nomad, nomad, having spent a full year traveling the U.S. and putting the mobility of her business to the test. She has been featured in the Huffington Post, WGN Radio, the Los Angeles Times, and various national and local media outlets. Leanne is also a runner and triathlete who recently completed her first full Ironman event, Leanne, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. I'm excited for our talk today. <laughs> me too, me too. And, and what I always start out with, just to give the listeners context, is tell the listeners how you and I met. Oh gosh, we met through uh, through our mutual friend, Michael Shiraz. Shout out to Michael. Um, and he, I can't remember what prompted him to say that we should connect, but we did. And I, I actually still remember our first conversation. I remember I was sitting in my old condo and having a talk with you about um, what you were doing, what you're up to, which I've always loved. And, uh, and just, you're one of those people that is like, ah, oh, I, wanna, I wanna talk to that guy more. <laughs> what do you our, remember about it? Well, what I remember you- that very well. And I also remember another little sidebar to it is, is Michael said, you should meet Leanne. And, and it wasn't like a setup or anything. It was just that she's really cool. And, and the one of the things I love about what you and I do as entrepreneurs or solopreneurs is just, you meet so many like-minded people, and that's the best word I can use to describe it, that just have the same thinking that want to impact lives, make a difference, you know, just have an ability to teach and to have a lifelong learning kind of uh, mindset and so forth. And so I, and of course, I called her back later and I said, oh, I just love her. She's so cool. And then you and I have done some things together since then. But I do remember saying to you, I was so impressed with you. So I'm going to come back and meet you sometime this year. Oh, that was like six or seven years ago. So I'm still, I'm still working on the promise. I haven't forgotten to get back to Chicago. So of course there was a, there was a pandemic, a little bit, a few things happened along the way. So Let's back up a little bit, Leanne, and tell the listeners, I know you've been an attorney before and some of the things you've done, long distance runner, you know, you had a a speed dating thing. I think the listeners might be interested to hear about. So back up a little bit and tell people sort of the early years of Leanne before we get to email with heart. Oh, wow. Okay. How far back are we? (laughs) Um, Let's see. My first entrepreneurial venture was selling flavored toothpicks on the bus in middle school. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> see, um, yeah, it's funny. I remember, um, it, uh, you know, I'm going to say my age, but, um, you know, at the drugstore, they used to have those little vials of like, uh, flavored oils, peppermint, oh, cinnamon, and wintergreen. And I, and I got them and I soaked toothpicks in them. And then I would sell them, I think for like, you know, a penny a piece, but <laughs> 
a nickel for a pack of 10 or something. I don't know. I remember creating a little brochure at one point and then the, they, uh, the, the man shut me down because apparently selling sharp things on a bus they thought was not a good idea. Oh, sure. I don't know. Anyway, um, but fast forward. <laughs> after law school, I feel like my, my journey really began after law school. I, I practiced from, originally from Ohio. I practiced law for a couple of years and then I moved to California originally to practice entertainment law because I thought I wasn't really happy with practicing. And it's like, I always wanted to live in California and the sunshine. And I thought, well, entertainment law, you know, that that'll be the marriage of my love of music and and lawyering. And then I moved out there and then realized that I, because I didn't pass the bar, the California bar the first time. And while I was studying for it the second time, I realized I didn't like practicing at all. And that started me on a journey. And then right around the same time, I started on this journey of professional development and listening to those, um, remember those Nightingale Conant catalogs? Yeah, Nightingale Conant, yep. Would come Late. in in the paper form and, and I right. flipped through and I'd have those like Southern California as a car mentality. So I would buy the Tony Robbins tapes and Tony the Robbins. Zig Ziglar and um, uh, personal power, I think was one of Tony yeah, Robbins' yes. early ones and get yes. the edge. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, Jim, uh, Jim Rohn, Jim one Rohn. of my other mm -hmm. favorites. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would listen to all those and that, that started me on this uh, personal development path mm -hmm. of, you know, learning and growing and just understanding that I was responsible for my own experience and kind of that. And I think that really helped me ultimately get on the entrepreneurial path. So, yeah, that's cool. And, and what did you, what was your biggest takeaway from there? Cause one of the things I'm always going to ask guests on this show is, is what are you most grateful for? And so as you look at these different phases, whether it was the flavored toothpicks or, or any of those things, and then doing the personal power and that kind of thing, what, what was, what was kind of the gratitude understanding? Are you grateful that you were trying to get into self-help or understand or be an entrepreneur? Or how did that figure in your mind? Well, the, I, I feel like the, one of the, one of the greatest gifts that I have is being able to look back and see um, every experience that I've had, even the quote unquote, you know, bad ones or less than desirable ones as a gift and right. noticing that, because really an experience is just an experience and you're the one that decides if it's good or bad. And so, you know, failing the California bar the first time I took it, I could look at that as a bad experience. And yet that space between the first time I took it and the second time, I passed the second time, by the way. Mm, and yeah, but, but in that space, I realized I didn't want to practice law anymore. And that was a tremendous gift. Mm. And then from there, I got into court reporting sales. And from there, I discovered coaching. And from there, I um, you know, started my own business, the speed dating company. And so every little thing along the way, if you choose to see the gift or the, the positive side of it, can fuel the, the next lesson, the next iteration, the next part of your journey. Mm hmm and, you know, and I think, as you said, I didn't want to practice law. Do you remember what happened in your mind about why? I mean, you go to law school, you have to have an undergraduate degree, you then go to law school, I think it's typically two years. So yeah. do you remember what happened? Did it happen overnight? Was it gradual? All of a sudden, one day you woke up, I don't want to practice law. How did that work for you? Um, there were, so there were building blocks to it. So, the, so part one was me realizing I didn't want to um, practice law at the firm that I was at in Ohio. Mm. Um, and I didn't want to practice the form of the part of law that I was in. I was doing auto product liability defense litigation for automobile manufacturers. Oh, wow. Wow. And um, so seatbelts and airbags and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember I'm um, go on being on the way to a, the holiday party for the firm. And i um, the, one of the partners said, you know, well, Leanne, you know, Leanne, you only build X number of hours last month and you know, you're oh. never going to make partner billing X number of hours. And I was like, who said that's what I wanted. And that just flew out of my mouth. And then it was like, oh, <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, wait a second. The path that I'm on this path, right. that's where it leads. And do I really want to be on that path? So that was what prompted the move to California. Now I don't want to be on that path in this place doing this kind of law. Okay. But then once I got to California and needed a job just to make money, you know, and originally I thought I would, of course, pass the bar and get a job practicing law. But since I couldn't, because I didn't pass the bar, um, and in California, because the bar passage rate is so low, they won't hire you as an attorney until you actually pass the bar oh, um, if you're coming from out of state. 
And so I ended up working as um, my, uh, I, I had convinced a friend to move with me at the time and she was able to transfer her job and open at, at, at an office for the company she worked for in the, one of those executive suite companies. So this was oh, before yeah. co-working days, right? This is the late nineties. So it was before co-working um, existed. And so I got a job as the receptionist for that, um, that particular office suite company. And people with, and it was $15 an hour, you know, mm-hmm. and people would say, you're the best receptionist we've ever had. And I'm like, I'm terribly overqualified for this job. And I realized I was happy. I was happier than I'd been in years being the receptionist, making $15 an hour. And that was what shifted for me about, wow, really, um, if you're this happy doing this work, that's really not even in your gift zone. But if you're, if there's that much of a difference then really practicing law, it, it should not be where your focus is. Yeah. The reason I ask that sometimes is I'm always curious about the, the sort of transition from one decision to another. And I've noticed in my life, I look back and, you know, I felt, you know, I was always going to turn left. And then the same thing on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I wake up Tuesday morning. No, I want to turn right. Well, what happened from Monday night to Tuesday morning? I don't know. But finally, the, the, you know, wand or whatever you want to call it, the needle changed to the other side. So another thing I happen to know in your past, and you mentioned it, talk a little bit, because I think this is really cool, a little bit about the speed dating thing, (laughs) because as I understand it, weren't you the one that originated that? I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I was, thank you. I was the first person to hold a speed dating event outside of the Jewish community. Um, And my first event was actually, I just had the 20 year anniversary. It was April 15th, um, 2001. Wow. And um, the, yeah, and that's a whole whole collection of things that randomly happened. But um, the, so I had, so let me back up just a little bit. The, uh, by, by January, 2001, um, I had at this point discovered coaching, um, that, which is actually Michael Shares, the guy who introduced the two of us. Mm-hmm. I met him in November, 98, um, at a coach you like intro weekend. Um, and he just happened to sit, uh, sat behind me and my friend, he, he will tell the story that, sorry, there's a lot of divergent in the story, but you know. <laughs> He'll tell the story that he walked in and said, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit behind the, the two best looking women in the room, it was me and my friend. <laughs> and he sat behind us and struck up a conversation. And so that's how we started becoming friends. But I got into coaching and I had, um, I've been working for a Fortune 500. I created their professional development division. Um, and, it, and I was realizing that um, to meet the numbers of a Fortune 500, it just wasn't going to work out with the, the model and all of that. So I was, again, searching for my next thing. And, um, and in the midst of it, um, I'm single. And so I had this party where it was like, bring your friend, you know, bring a single friend. Um, and at my apartment, my one bedroom apartment, uh, more than 200 people got invited. And I can't remember how many showed up, but it was like, whoa. And so I was talking with a friend after that. Well, maybe, maybe I could make a business out of this. And it, oh, neat. it started as singles events. Um, single solutions was the original name of the company. And as I was in that ideation stage, I happened to be traveling to speak at a conference and I had the TV on and I saw this story on speed dating and, but it was being held by a, um, a, uh, what do I want to call it? A temple, a temple or something. Yes. Yes. And um, it originated in the Jewish community. And I was like, wow, that's a great idea. I'm not Jewish. Like, I'd love to do it. Someone should do that in the non-denominational world. Mm -hmm. And little did I know, I would end up starting a singles company. And then I thought, wow, I should do one of those speed dating events. That would be really fun. And so um, I did my first one and my website traffic quadrupled and the event sold out and everyone was really into it. And I just kind of figured out the best way to run those events. And that ended up, I ended up forgetting all the other events and then um, focused just on those events. And it was, and, and then 9-11 happened oh, and 9-11 right. changed everything. Everybody oh, realized. Right. It would have been six months later, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. Oh. Yes. Everybody's priority changed at 9-11. So that was one thing. So people who was like, oh, I'm single. I don't know. It was, you knew if you had somebody to call that day. Mm. So that shifted. And then the other thing that shifted that ended up really helping my business was the um the luxury travel went all went down but oh, it, it was around all that time and um somebody in uh who who was at the Lowe's Santa Monica Beach Hotel which was this luxury hotel right on the water there in Santa Monica 
somebody, um, the food and beverage director had this idea that it'd be great to have singles events in the lounge, thinking that, you know, that could be a way to generate revenue for the hotel. So he asked his coworker, do you know anyone who runs singles events? She knew me through oh, the coaching world wow. and made the introduction. And we started hosting our events there. And that really put us on the map because we had this beautiful space that was very high end, really wow. established our brand. Um, and they were wonderful to us. So it just, it really set everything in motion. Gosh, a lot of serendipity. I'll tell you, that's interesting too. Yeah. So then Leon, when did you, after that, so now we're talking September 11, 2001, when did you go head back to Chicago? And in, what was it in between that two, those two places? Yeah. So I moved to Chicago in 2007. Okay. Um, and um, I moved because the, so in, so I did speed dating for a few years. I took on a business partner. Uh, we were on national television. We, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of things happened. And, and, and the email tie-in is I built my email list to 20,000 subscribers with wow. zero advertising, zero um, buying of lists, just organically. Just word of mouth. Wow. Just word of mouth. Um, and PR, like we were on the radio and in the oh, sure. we had a lot of that happening. Um, so so I did that and I sold that business um, in 2004. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up getting into, um, I, I ended up, I tried to do a couple of things on my own, but I just financially, I couldn't figure out how to make it work to be perfectly honest. And so I went to, went back into working for corporate and I worked for law firms, international law firms doing marketing and business development. So it was like a marriage of my legal background and now my marketing and business development experience from having my own business and from, from doing sales and a few other things in between. And so I worked for this international law firm in LA and then I decided that I wanted to move to Chicago and I can tell you that story if you want, but I made that decision and ended up coming to Chicago to work for another international law firm. Wow. And then that set the things in motion where I'm at now. And then, and so then when kind of bringing it up to current, when did the current iteration, if you will, start of email with heart and all that, what year was that? Yeah. 10 years ago was when I started my business that has ultimately become email oh, with heart. 2010 yeah. or something like that. 2011. 2011. Yeah. Something in there mm -hmm. because so fill the listeners in on kind of what you do, because I, I think as I listen to this litany of, of spaces and jobs and places and things, I just, <laughs> Maybe it's an assumption, but I just got to believe you like what you do now more than anything you've ever done. Absolutely. And, and then as a result, my favorite word, I would imagine you're quite grateful that you kept push, pushing, pushing and finding something new and, and going crisscrossing the country from, you know, back East to LA and back to Chicago. And I just think about my, I'm in a number of years older than you are, but my generation, maybe your parents, but it was 50 years at the same place, get a gold watch. And it was one job. And if you even had two jobs, you were considered some sort of a flake. And now the current one, if, if somebody doesn't have at least 10 or 15 career changes or something, so you kind of did that, which is really neat. And so that had to really contribute to you enjoying what you do as much today. For sure. For sure. Well, the, you know, there's a couple of things in there. One is that I've always made my decisions, especially major life decisions. Like, should I move to California? Should I quit being a lawyer? Should I open my own business? I've, I've made all those decisions under the, the lens of, I never want to live in regret. Mm -hmm. So will I live, would I regret more staying in Ohio or going to LA and trying it? Right. And I always figured if I went to LA and tried it and hated it, I could always come back to Ohio. Mm. So, um, you know, but, but if I never went to LA and I stayed in Ohio, I would always wonder. And, and I didn't want to live with that wonder and potential regret. Right. Um, same with moving from LA to Chicago, same with starting my own business, you know, both times. Um, so that's been one piece of it is just my perspective of, I'm a, I have obviously a high tolerance for risk. And I also mm -hmm. just want to live with the, I'd rather live with the consequences of a quote unquote bad decision right. than, the, than not taking that step and, exactly. and what might happen. Um, so that's one. The other one is, um, I feel that the, the gold in entrepreneurship is having, having a vision and a destination that you want to go to. I think clarity around that really helps. And then it, uh, my, my coach calls it equanimity, being totally devoted to that division and then being completely unattached to the vision mm. so that you can uh, flow and, and see what happens and see what comes up and, and, and be able to iterate when it makes sense. Um, and the you know, my whole career is an example of that. And this business really is because 10 years ago, 
the original iteration of it was Busy Girl's Guide to Running. And mm -hmm. it was to be a motivational right. coach for women runners. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I, I started this by saying, I started that business saying, I know I want to build my email list because of the speed dating um, experience that I had and how, you know, how much, um, you know, we built that into a six figure business really based on the email list. So I started doing that with the running and I would go out and network and people will come up and say, oh yeah, this is great. I've been on your website. I really love when you enter your name and your email and you get the video series. Can you teach me how to do that? And so after a year, I organically had all these business clients and no running, no one was buying, <laughs> buying running. And so I was like, okay, busy girl guide to business. Like I'll just switch. Cause I wasn't attached to how I helped people. I really just wanted, I wanted my life to matter. I wanted to show up and make an impact. I wanted to help people see a different way, a better way of being. I didn't care if it was running or email or whatever. And so being able, being open enough to make that shift has has continued on the path to today where it's like you know I really have honed in on how I deliver my services and what I do and I love it I do I love it I love my people I help it's really important to me to resonate with the voices that I want to amplify and and really believe in the people and what they're doing what they're putting out in the world and and help people to reach their audience in a much more heart-centered way mm -hmm. and so um being open to how things unfold it is, is what has gotten me here. And it's interesting because you're obviously very passionate about what you do. I am as well. One of the reasons why you and I connect so well. I'm still trying to figure out another word for the word work because I just think there's such a negative connotation. When I was a little boy, my dad, I have to go to work. And anyway, I, I'm going to be late at work and he isn't going to be home in time after work. You know, right. and I look at what you do and what I do is a passion. But I'm saying somebody said joyful work, which I like that, but I'm, I'm looking for a single word like, you know, passion or something. And I haven't gotten it. That's that's a substitute because when I say, well, I'm talking to my friend Leanne and Leanne's busy. Well, I've got a, just a ton of work to do later this afternoon. It doesn't feel like work. So and I think that's something where when, you know, obviously gratitude is my theme. And I just think you and I are so grateful to be able to do what we love to do. And again, it doesn't seem like work. And it's just. I just think these surveys will say 70% of people hate their jobs, but at the same time, um, you went out there and kept trying and you didn't just settle to just be doing the, you could still be doing cinnamon toothpicks or cinnamon oil or something after all these years, you know, if you decide that's all you want to do, but it's like, it's, you keep trying. And that's why I think I always want to have a couple of tips and I think about, and we're going to touch on it in a second, but I put, wrote down here, never want to live with regret, which I think is really fantastic. And you said having a vision. And then I wrote, you said, you can also kind of un be disconnected. So maybe even being able to pivot would that be, I know that word gets used a lot, but having the vision, but then being able to pivot or redirect, if you will. But what's, what's a couple other tips that Leanne would say to that person out there that's saying, well, I kind of want to be like you and I want to be an entrepreneur. What are the things would you suggest to them to focus on? Um, well, one is to not get to, um, how do I want to say, focus, focus on the kind of what's the, what's I always call the next best step. What's the next best step you can take mm. instead of being too worried about the, uh, where it's going to go. So I think sometimes we get too caught up in, um, okay, well, I'm going to do this and then, and then I'll get a bunch of followers on Instagram and then I'll get the paid branding for this. And then I'll be on Oprah and then I'll write a book that'll make me a million dollars. And then I'll do the, and we're so far out. And right. So like, you know, it's going to do us that not only is it like, how do I get on Oprah? Well, there's, there's like a thousand steps between here and Oprah, or maybe right. 10, if you do them the right way. Yeah. But there's more than one mm -hmm. and we get too caught up in that. And then that prevents us from taking the next step, which, right. you know, may or may not look like it connects to that one. So, um, so it's that saying, and, and that's that equanimity part, right? I, I would like to be on Oprah and I'm not going to worry about how I'm going to be on Oprah. I'm going to just focus on this next step that feels really good. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of it. Because the other thing is too, sometimes we get so connected to, you know, attached to what we want to create that um, if it doesn't, if the next step doesn't seem like it's going to take us there, we won't necessarily take it. And the next step might be the one that takes us to somewhere completely different, but equally or more amazing. Right. But we're too, we can't see it. So um, so part of it is not being attached to that. And part of it is just following where that free energy flows. The, um, 
you know, that year that I spent doing the running thing, you know, one lens with which to look at that year is, man, I wasted a year. I didn't make any, you know, I made like $11,000 that year, like Mm -hmm. the revenue and, you know, and, and then I, you know, bagged it to go in this other direction. And yet that year was full of gold. That year helped me clarify um, that I do just want to help people and there might be a different way. It helped me tap into this whole thing that's become email with heart, which is amazing. It, I got the experience of running a membership, which I now run way more successfully. Mm-hmm. Um, I got the experience of the backend technology. I got the experience of email. I got, I got all these experiences that now when I look back, I go, wow, if I wouldn't have had that and that and that and that and that, my business wouldn't run as well as it runs today. Right. But I couldn't see that in that right. moment. And I think sometimes too, it's a mindset too, that some people just have and don't have. I've said, for instance, I don't, I think, I think there's certain things you can't teach. I don't think you can teach a work ethic. I don't think yeah. you can teach personality or sense of humor. You can't take the class work ethic 101 and get an A yeah. and now you have a work ethic. So it's yeah. kind of in you sometimes. And uh, so I was, I was thinking of motivation too. And I remember a friend of mine telling about his buddy would sit in his apartment with his TV clicker, changing the channels going, how come I can never meet any women? Is he's just changing from what? Well, you might have to right. leave the apartment. Might right. help, you know, and you actually get out right. here too. So right. maybe sometimes it would be obvious to you or me, but maybe not somebody else. So with that in mind, here's something else I would love you hear your input on. And every time I've ever talked to you, you've always got a smile on your face. You've always got a nice thing to say, and you know that's true with a fair amount of people, but not everybody. And if I think back on trying these different things, and and well, maybe we can do the speed date, and then back to the cinnamon toothpicks or whatever it might be, and then eventually coming down to where you are now and what you have, and understanding back end things and memberships and the things that you said, is but also you are quite a triathlete and a runner and have a lot of ribbons. I've seen the pictures before and so forth. So where does Leanne Marie Webster think her motivation came from? Um comes from a lot of places. <laughs> I'm more significant than others. And because I think of oftentimes parents or a professor or a coach or a teacher, or any anything or specific one or two people that you can just draw back to or think that maybe had that a bigger impact than others well, well there's a lot of people who have um there's there's a lot of like touch points in my life where i could have gone left and i went right because somebody just popped in at the right moment um law school is a great example um i never had that on my radar and then i took in college i was a journalism major at ohio university go bobcat um and i in, and part of my required courses was this media law course. And it was taught by a local attorney. And I just really resonated with the guy. He was a wonderful man and a wonderful professor. And somehow it started that after every class, we would kind of walk out of class together. And I'd ask him questions and we'd talk. Oh, nice. And one day he turned to me and said, when are you going to go to law school? Or where are you going to go? To law school? Something like that. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to law school. And he's like, well, why? And I said, oh, I'm I'm not smart enough and I don't have the money. And, you know, I just, I don't see that happening. And he was like, well, you're, you're absolutely smart enough. You know, you're, you know, I see you and, you know, no, no, no. And, you know, don't worry about the money. Famous last words, by the way, <laughs> you can always take out loans, but I'm still paying <laughs> yeah. back. But anyway, but, um, but, you know, he really encouraged me. And it's like that one conversation I went, oh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I could go to law school. And so then I, I interned with him that summer and it just like that, that little ink just pushed, turned me over here, got me into law school, which even though I don't practice, I'm so tremendously grateful for having that education for, you know, what it did to me, my life, my, you know, everything, all the, all the roads. That's what drew me to California. That's what got me, you know, taking a lot of different things. So it's, um, so there's a lot of little moments like that. Right. And I think the overall, one of the bigger inspirations, I'm going to see if I can articulate this the right way, but, you know, growing up, my uh, dad was an alcoholic. My mom was bipolar. My parents divorced when I was four, when I was three. Um, I have a, a brother who passed when I was four. So there was a lot of darkness in my early years. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of unhappiness. Um, and, and I remember heaviness um, growing up and not a lot of light. And there's something, something inside of me that said, that's not how my life is going to be. Mm. And I can't tell you why. I can't tell you um, 
how that happened. I, my grandmother was an inspiration at different points, but there's just something inside of me that was like, that's, that's not what my life is about. That's not who I'm right. going to be. And I'm going to, everything that I can is going to be around being, you know, light and having fun and enjoying life and, and, and letting me be intentional about life and not having life happen to me and not having my circumstances dictate whether I'm here and whether I'm present, whether I'm enjoying it. Yeah. And, that, and that's such a good point. And I think that, you know, sometimes through the heaviness, uh, the darkness, as you describe it, I've often said, you know, like people believe you can't appreciate up until you've seen down. And as you went through those various down things, and I'm always trying to look for, I know there's m multiple things, but if you were to pick out one or two things, what going through those events, what was your best coping mechanism? I think just relying on myself, just knowing that it was, it, it, it was internal. But, and, and I don't know that I connected that dot until really um, when I started listening to those tapes, you know, the, oh, yeah. and that, that helped me so much hearing the Tony Robbins and the Zig Ziglar and the Jim Rohn and, and all of those really talking about finding it within yourself and creating your own destiny and creating your own world. Um, you know, there was like a seed in there, but it's like it got, it, it got watered and fertilized with those tapes. And, and that put me on a path that I've been on for um, really 20 years or more. And I think mm -hmm. there's something that's really important, at least to me, because mine was very similar. And I know that uh, personal power, it was cassette tapes back then, then it was CDs. And of course, now it's all downloaded and things, but Tony Robbins and, and Brian Tracy, just various people. Yeah. But I think that not only does it take that ability to say, I want to do better and maybe my parents, your dad was an alcoholic and their divorce and different things that happen. And I'm going to do better than this, make a better life for myself and get a better relationship with the person in the mirror. But also there was another side of it that I never appreciated is that people that gave me crap about it. Oh, look at that woo woo stuff. What's that tape you're listening to? Or and you had to kind of fight through that too. Like, no, it's not. I'm just trying to make myself better. Oh, you can be better than the rest of us. Or you, there was always that element out there. And I thought, you know what? I don't care what they think because I contend and I bring this up in my talks a lot. The most important relationship you'll ever have is the one you have with yourself. And the stronger you have that relationship with the person in the mirror, the better your life works. And you have better self-confidence, self-esteem, self-awareness, yeah. you know, all those things you, you don't have to worry what other people think of you about the, the way we all do behave in strange ways when worried how somebody thinks of us and so forth. So that whole wanting to get better. And I think as I was asking you about coping mechanism, I'm thinking back on how I've decided I've been very comfortable with this answer. And I never thought I would be to some of these questions. And that is, I don't know. And I go, no, it's what you got to have. It. No, no, I, you, David, you're not hearing me. I don't know. And, so I, <laughs> and, I, and I've decided that's okay. It's kind yeah. of the same thing when I think about, you mentioned alcoholic parents and my my dad committed suicide and my mom died of cancer when I was pretty young. And then my wife later died. And there's been a lot of things that have really, you know, knocked me down and so on. But, you know, you, you get to make a choice every day when you get up to be positive or negative and it's your life and it's a choice. And people would start sentences with, you don't understand. And the minute they start with, you don't understand, I go, don't even finish the sentence because it's going to yeah. be an excuse or something that's coming. But I thought it's, but I cannot deny the fact that I still think sometimes we win the birth lottery. And that is, we just happen to all of a sudden one day, Leanne Marie Webster came along, David George Rook came along. Here's the two parents that, that brought us into the world. And in, in, in both our cases, not exactly, uh, you know, all-star parents, but, but look how you and I were able to rise above that and say, that's fine. Not making excuses might be an explanation, but I'm not making an excuse. I'm going to go out here and really, really, really kick myself in the rear and get going. And I think another term, I think this gets used maybe sometimes too much, but it's kind of reinvent yourself. You've reinvented yourself a half a dozen times or, or more. And it's yeah. so important because it takes courage to do that. And mm -hmm. it takes confidence and, and the ability to withstand some of the, the attacks. I, I know at my age, I'm going to work forever. And I've got friends of mine that, you know, they're retired. And I mean, how much golf can you play? And how many times can you go to Starbucks? And so right. I, I love what I do and I feel blessed. And I think sometimes they're kind of bored. And I just think, gosh, how is it that my life worked out this way? This is so cool. But you are looking at the bigger picture. In fact, I want to go back. So we're just going to wrap up in a couple of minutes. And I think, and if you can add to this, Leanne, I put just some tips from Leanne, never want to live in regret. And I think that's so mm -hmm. true. Uh, the five regrets of the dying. One of the things that the five say is 
I wish I'd been, I'd kept more in touch with my friends. Uh, I mm -hmm. wish I had, I'd lived the life true to myself and not what other people expected from me. You're going to go to law mm -hmm. school you now and, and this kind of thing. And so when you live in regret, that's pretty tough. And then you, you can't go back and get your life back again. Having a vision you mentioned, and I put being able to pivot as well, uh, focus down the road and kind of see the bigger picture. There's a saying I need to memorize that says like, the way you get a goal, you start with a, a date, a goal, you set a goal and you get a date, then you put a plan into place and then you do action steps. And then when you take the action steps, the dream comes true or that you get to the mm. goal, but it's got to be broken down into bite-sized pieces. And, you know, yeah. they say every journey, you know, mile journey, whatever, it starts with one small step, but it's so true, but you want to see the bigger picture. It's kind of like goals. You should have a one year, a five year and a 10 year. You know, the, the one year you're going to make some money, make sure you have food and so on and so forth, five year, whatever. So, so important to have to see the bigger picture. And then number four, you have is be intentional, which is so powerful to me, mm -hmm. just setting the intention, seeing yourself in that place. So anything you would add, Leanne, to those four as another tip or two? Um, I really love that you pulled those out. Those were really good. The, um, the, the other big one I have is to really be open to the magic. Mm. Um, and here's what I mean by that. The, first of all, one of my favorite books that really speaks to this way better than I can is uh, called Leveraging the Universe, and it's by Mike Dooley. And he um, does the tut.com, the notes from the universe. Um, and he speaks a lot to this, that, 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 you know, sometimes we're attached to the outcome as we've been talking about, right? Like, but, and the reason we want to you know, make X amount of money or go travel with so-and-so or have this house or whatever is because we really believe that will make us happy. Right. And so if you can, if the attachment you can have is not to the big house or to the car or to the trip or to the, you know, spouse or whatever, if the attachment is to being happy, then that gives you the flexibility to, to open up to the how. And the, um, the best example I have of this in, in my life is this exercise that I did. I just kind of made it up one time as I was, I was on a plane and I, I find uh, a lot of times I don't do work on the plane because I like to, I feel like it's one of those times when I can be really just in a different vibe. Right. And so I was in this space where I felt a little stuck with things and, and I thought, all right, let me just take a step back. And I thought, what are the, what are some of the best experiences I've had in my life? Like, what are some of the moments in my life that have been like, whoa, I can't believe I could have lived without that. Or I can't believe I could have not had that happen. Like moving to Chicago, you know, running the speed dating business, the finishing Iron Man, and, and even down to, um, you know, making love with someone you're in love with, they, you know, all different. So I, I wrote this big list and then I looked at the things on the list and it was like, what, the one commonality I could find was that for all of those things, at some point in my life, they weren't on my radar. Meaning mm. it's not like I always wanted to finish Ironman. It's not like that was always a dream of mine. There was a time when I didn't even run. I couldn't even run a mile. Um, you know, so Ironman was even outside of the scope. And, and I even, at one point when I learned what an Ironman was, I was like, that's stupid. Like who, <laughs> who would try that? Who would even try that? That's ridiculous. And then I later finished one. So at some point, each of the things on my list were something that I, I hadn't, I didn't strive for. I wasn't like, you know, moving towards, and it happened and it became one of the best moments of my life. Wow. And so that taught me that there's this whole world out there. There's like a hundred more experiences, maybe a thousand more experiences that I'm going to have in my life that I can't even tell you what they are right now. Exactly. You don't even know. And if I can leave myself open to one of those experiences coming in, however it comes in, right? With the conversation that I have that leads to doing this, that leads to that, that leads to that. If I can leave myself open to that magic in between, then whoa, what's gonna come into my life? That's such a good point. And it kind of, the word organic get used, gets used a lot, but I feel it's kind of like the organic thing. And it's interesting, what are some of the best experiences in my life? Ironically enough, about six months ago, I added this exercise to one of my modules for my keynote. And it was the most memorable events of your life. And I tell them to go through and do it. And then I said, you can do three things. You can do a top 50, a top 25, a top 50, or top 100. And then put it on an Excel spreadsheet, put it on a Word doc, put it in priority. Number one for me was the birth of my younger son. Number one mm -hmm. thing, best thing in my life, whole life. Number mm -hmm. two is, is my, my second son who I adopted. And then oh. going through all these things, speaking to 10,000 soldiers. And, and one of the things I told somebody, as I said, well, you're in a bad mood, go look at that list today. Uh, it'll snap you out of it. 
you know, and so mm-hmm. keep it on a bulletin board on the refrigerator mm-hmm. on the on the desktop or what have you. So such a good important uh, lesson and reminder. And I think like that friend with the clicker, this is something you said you got to be open. you can't stay in your apartment and expect these things to happen. So with these where all of a sudden you get out and have these experiences, as you said, and well, well said, things you and I both know don't even know that have happened because we don't know that they're on our radar, but we're out there connecting with people. And yeah. you know that like attracts like and that's what's so much fun to always talk to you because there's just mm-hmm. There's just this energy and this sort of synergy, these two gears just kind of meshing. So, well, we've got to wrap up. We've gone a little bit long. And so I always say my last question for this question for my guest, and that is, without revealing your age, what does Leanne Marie Webster know at this age that you would have, and you get to pick one thing that you would have liked to have known and would have helped you at 18? There's so much magic coming. There's so much magic oh, that's coming. Nice. Just chill out, man. It's going to be an amazing ride. I like. I'm going to. I'm going to make that quote. There is so much magic coming. And speaking of quotes, too, I will put your links in the show notes too. And uh, but I love that. What a great way to end. There is so much magic coming. Gosh, I just happen to love that question. And, and love your thighs because they're never going to look as good as they are. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll get to the wrapping up thing. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. I Thank really you. appreciate so it. And fun. so I, re- I covered some of the takeaways. I think you got most of those, but I'm going to repeat this one more time. There is so much magic coming. I really like that. But just as a reminder, uh, that's it for this episode. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and other uh, podcast places. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I do appreciate that. Purchase a gratitude journal or find out more about my gratitude speaking and coaching. You can connect with me at thatgratitudeguide.com. If you'd like to receive my Monday morning minute, I send out every Monday, what a coincidence, a 60 second minute or 60 second minute. That's cool. (laughs) A 60 second video with another theme of the week with something always, of course, to do with gratitude. Go to your text and text the number 22828. That's a five digit number, 22828. In the text box and in the ma- in the message box, type in the word gratitude guy, all one word, and they will send you a link to get hooked up for that. And also as an exclusive for my podcast listeners, I'm offering my six-month proprietary gratitude coaching program that can transform your life for the three-month price. Just email me and let me know you heard about it on the podcast. So finally, thank you so much for tuning in. I just appreciate all you listeners. And until next time, I am David George Brook, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. Take care. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.